Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Peter Husey, and I'm Director of Strategic Deterrence Studies here at the Mitchell Institute, and I want to welcome you to the next in our series of Nuclear Deterrent and Missile Defense Forums. We're very pleased today to have Dr. Robert Sufer and Dr. John Harvey. Dr. Sufer and Dr. Harvey are experts in the field of nuclear and missile defense policy. They both served in senior positions in the Department of Defense. Dr. Sufer, for example, was previously Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Nuclear and Missile Defense Policy, and Dr. Harvey served as Principal Deputy Assistant to the Secretary of Defense for Nuclear, Chemical, and Biological Defense Programs. I want to welcome you both, Dr. Harvey, Dr. Sufer. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. Today's discussion will not only address nuclear issues, but also the missile defense side of the nuclear deterrent equation. I'd like to start off by giving you both an opportunity to make a few opening remarks. And as a note to our audience, feel free to raise your hand using the function on the app or submit a question in the Q&A window anytime during the discussion. We'll get to those questions in the second half of our session. So over to you, John Harvey, and welcome. Peter, thank you. Rob, it's great to be on the dais with you. Um, I want to start my, irrespective of what the title of my remarks are, what I'm going to talk a little bit about is setting the context for the Biden nuclear posture review. Uh, and uh, in doing so, uh, I I'm going to touch on a few questions. The questions are, what are the common elements of U.S. nuclear posture over decades? What nuclear deterrence policies underlie that posture? What are the handful of key issues that will drive the Biden nuclear posture review? What might we expect from that NPR once it is completed? And finally, what impact will any policy changes have on continued bipartisan support in Congress for nuclear modernization? And I wanna uh, thank Rob for basically his work on SAS and his work in the Trump administration in helping to foster continued bipartisan support and modernization. In setting the stage for the Biden NPR, it's important to remember past lessons learned. The end of the Cold War, as you guys will recall, was followed by mere, nearly two decades of confusion and divisive debate over the post-Cold War role and mission of nuclear weapons. Force modernization long overdue was further stalled as a result. At, one, at least one member of Congress had had enough, and I want to call out the late Representative Ellen Tauscher, who told us what was needed. Our strategic posture, she said, should place the stewardship of our nuclear arsenal, non-proliferation programs, missile defenses, and the international arms control regime into one comprehensive strategy that protects the American people. At her initiative near the end of Bush II's second term, Congress established the Bipartisan Congressional Commission on the Strategic Posture of the United States, the so-called Perry Schlesinger Commission, which succeeded in finding a path out of the mess we were in. Uh, its work was exploited extensively by Mr. Obama and his team, many of whom worked on the commission and, as Ellen did, entered his administration to help craft that comprehensive strategy. I want to review for you uh, the, uh, uh, I want to make clear that over, for the last, at least the last five presidents, there has been an, a remarkable amount of continuity in U.S. nuclear policy. And I want to touch on key elements of our posture and our strategy with an, and with a nod to the longstanding constants in policy. Well, first of all, what is the role of nuclear weapons? What is the role of nuclear forces? Well, that's more strategy than posture, but it's longstanding policy that uh, deterring nuclear attack and responding to such attacks, if deterrence fails, has been the primary, but not the sole purpose of US nuclear forces. And nuclear forces deter, among other things, uh, large conventional wars among the, the nuclear powers. Force size, composition, capabilities, and, and, and alert posture. These are elements of our posture. I mean, we, we should recall that deterrence is based not simply on having nuclear forces, not on simply on their existence, but on their ability to hold at risk assets most valued by the adversary. And force size, composition, and capabilities thus matter and may be adjusted as deterrence needs evolve. Strategic triad. A triad assures that deterrence objectives are achieved under all conditions of warning and alert and serves as well to complicate enemy attack planning. Constant, another strong constant in US policy. Employment policy governs the use of nuclear weapons in peacetime and in war. 
from it other aspects of alert posture, plans, training, exercises, signaling, and strike operations are derived. Declaratory policy, what we say or don't say about the circumstances under which the US would or would not employ nuclear weapons. And in this connection, uh, the watchword for the United States has been that ambiguity in our declaratory policy uh, breeds caution among the adversary. Signaling, well, signaling are options and not just words for conveying to an adversary that certain actions jeopardize vital national security interests in ways that could provoke a nuclear response. Hedging, very important. The ability to adapt the force and maintain deterrence in light of an un unanticipated technical problems with a warhead or delivery system or to geopolitical reversal. Extended deterrence, US nuclear forces, both central strategic forces and dual capable aircraft help to assure European and Asian allies of our commitments to their defense. And finally, uh, an element of our posture is the nuclear test moratorium. Despite the fact that the US has not ratified the CTBT, recent presidents have affirmed a test moratorium based on the ability of our national weapons labs now for over two decades to assess that the US nuclear stockpile remains safe and reliable. Each of these elements of US nuclear posture are likely to come under review in the Biden nuclear posture review. But where are we after eight years of Mr. Obama? Let me just uh, summarize. Obama reaffirmed key elements of US nuclear posture and achieved significant pieces of Ellen's comprehensive strategy, including New START, the JCPOA, and co cooperative threat reduction. Very importantly, he initiated a 30 year, 1.2 trillion nuclear modernization program that involves a near simultaneous replacement of every leg of the aging triad, a major upgrade to the nuclear command and control system, and recapitalization of NNSA's aging warhead production infrastructure. This program has, has so far received strong bipartisan support from Congress. The nuclear landscape after four years of Trump might well be cast as, and Rob, don't, don't growl on this, Obama continued, uh, uh, but with some very important refinements. His team, some would argue, seemed less attentive to Ellen's comprehensive strategy. That said, as a result of some policies and despite others, Trump remained, retained strong bipartisan support in advancing uh, in large part uh, the, the, the modernization program with a few uh, extra added uh, supplements. Where is Mr. Obama's NPR headed? We might expect, well, that's pure speculation on my part, but let me speculate. Okay, here's what I'm gonna say. Mr. Obama will affirm a worsened security environment that threats from Russia and China have evolved significantly since the last NPR he was involved in, which is 2010. He will affirm key elements of US long-term nuclear policy and posture. He will carry forward the bulk, but not possibly every piece of the modernization program that Obama and Trump have advanced. Uh, he will engage with Russia and China bilaterally, not trilaterally, on arms control and strategic stability. He will renew nuclear security summits to address post-Cold War nuclear risks. He will reinstate the JCPOA and he will advance a strengthened non-proliferation agenda. Harvey's predictions. As part of Mr. Biden's review, we should anticipate internal studies and vigorous debate on several issues. Here they are. Whether to change employment guidance and the impact of changes on the size and composition of the force. Whether we can afford the ongoing modernization program whether to slow down both GBSD and the recapitalization of NNSA's plutonium pit manufacturing infrastructure, whether to reverse the decision to begin a program to field a nuclear armed sea launch cruise missile, whether to adopt a declaratory policy of sole purpose or no first use or both or some other option, and whether prudent approaches exist for engaging Russia and China in productive nuclear dialogue. Uh, with regard to funding, so far so good. Mr. Biden has basically mapped over Mr. Trump's uh, modernization program into his FY22 budget. And of course, that will be pending uh, possible adjustments uh, when the NPR, his NPR is completed. Can we count on continued bipartisan support as the Biden administration and the Democratic-controlled Congress 
ramp up activities on the FY22 and FY23 budgets. I'm optimistic and here's why. Couple of points. Uh, there are more of them, but I wanna emphasize just a couple. Colin Call, the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy and the senior DOD official stewarding the Biden nuclear review recently spoke at the Carnegie Nuclear Fest 2021 conference in late June. He articulated a clear vision of the evolving threats posed by Russia and China, calling out their increased reliance on nuclear weapons. Regarding the US deterrent, he noted that, quote, the triad is a tried and true bedrock of our deterrence going back many, many decades and remains as valuable today as it ever has been, unquote. Senator Jack Reed and uh, Senator Jim Inhofe, the chair and ranking members of Senate Armed Services, with support from key staff are likely to continue in lockstep their bipartisan approach to modernization. Uh, Adam Smith, the chair of HASC, has stated a strong commitment to deterrence and has expressed a realist view that Congress supports vigorous modernization and that he has more to gain by seeking to shape it rather than to disrupt it. His ranking member, Mike Rogers from Alabama is an apt replacement for Mac Thornberry who retired, and I expect uh, Mike Rogers to work effectively with Representative Smith on modernization. And finally, uh, Senator John Tester, a backer of GBSD, chairs the Senate Appropriations Defense Subcommittee. This is not to say that we should not expect significant debate in Congress on nuclear policy and modernization programs, including in connection with potential Biden NPR issues identified earlier. But so far, Congress has supported a modernization program advanced by two very different presidents, and the prospects for further bipartisan support are encouraging. Let me conclude by noting that reviews of US nuclear strategy, posture, and policies carried out since the end of the Cold War, and even before, have reflected much more continuity than change. President Biden's review may be expected to follow in that mold. At the same time, there will be debate on a few key issues, and it is important that that debate be fully informed by previous deliberation on these same issues. If we are to change policies, there should be a strong and well-documented rationale for doing so. And let me, let me conclude there. Thank you, John Harvey. I appreciate it very much. And now over to you, uh, Dr. Super. Thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you, John. Great to be on this panel with you. Thank you for your kind words. And I would associate uh, myself with just about everything you said, particularly the, um, the ongoing support for the Obama-Trump modernization program. So I'd like to talk a bit about uh, missile defense and, uh, and essentially highlight three issues that I think will uh, be very uh, uh, important in uh, the, the uh, Biden review of the missile defense programs. But first, let me, let me say that uh, the budget request of $8.9 billion was uh, about $200 million less than what was requested last year, but uh, it was probably uh, s similar to the request that we would have seen under a Trump administration. So lots of continuity in terms of the funding. It's interesting to note that um, despite the fact that, that the administration requested $8.9 billion, Congress provided $10.5 billion in its appropriations, indicating Congress's strong support for missile defense. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if this year if that um, uh, uh, $9.2 billion request, um, uh, I'm sorry, the $8.9 billion request receives additional funding from Congress. Uh, but but let's 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 talk, let's focus mostly on three issues that I think are are, uh, are probably the most important and the thorniest policy issues. One is what to do about the next generation interceptor. This is the follow on to the, uh, to the ground-based interceptor. Second uh, is um, the, um, the SM3 Block 2A missile, which is a, a regional missile, whether or not to, to give that the capability to provide an, an additional uh, defensive layer for the US homeland. And third is the relationship between missile defense and arms control. As we know, uh, the Biden administration is anxious to talk with Russia and China about um, strategic stability and potentially arms control issues. So first with respect to NGI, just to remind everybody, uh, the, uh, the Obama and uh, uh, Trump administrations uh, endorsed the deployment of, of ground-based interceptors. There were 44 when, um, when Trump came into office, they made a decision to add 20 more of these. 
Uh, to remind you, under the Obama administration, they stopped at 44, but they made plans to modernize the kill vehicle that was on those ground-based interceptors. It was called the redesigned kill vehicle, RKB. What Trump has done is he said uh, they've, they've um, decided to upgrade the full round, not just the kill vehicle, but the booster itself. And so the new program is called the Next Generation Interceptor. And the plan was to deploy an additional or start deploying an additional 20 of these NGIs starting in 2028, right? So lots of consistency. And let me just remind everybody that in terms of homeland missile defense policy, the Obama administration and the Trump administration is very similar. We both say that with respect to, to Russia and China, we are going to maintain or we're going to rely on nuclear deterrence, right, to prevent uh, uh, or to deter Russian or Chinese nuclear attacks against the United States. But with respect to rogues, such as North Korea, we will, in the words of the 2010 Ballistic Missile Defense Review, we will maintain an advantageous position vis-a-vis -vis the rogues, right? In, 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 in Trump speak, we said that we are going to stay ahead of the North Korean threat. So we both agree that we want to stay ahead of the North Korean threat. With respect to a regional missile defense, we uh, provide, uh, our policy is to provide missile defenses against any source. This includes China and Russia in a regional context. And we can, we can, we can explain why that's uh, the case later on. But having said that, some uh, uh, politicians and analysts are questioning whether or not we need NGI. Uh, they question the efficacy of NGI and, and whether, whether we can actually stay ahead of the North Korean threat. And so let me respond to those, uh, to those uh, uh, concerns. First of all, the argument that uh, you know, we can't pace the, the North Korean threat because they're going to build so many more ICBMs and will deploy interceptors, I would just say that we don't know with certainty how many um, uh, ICBMs North Korea will, will develop. The intelligence is very low confidence in this area, and we concluded that adding an additional 20 ground-based interceptor, interceptors by 2028 would be sufficient to pace the threat. And we'd also hope to eliminate some of those, uh, those uh, ICBMs on the ground before they're launched, thus making the job of the, uh, the GMB system easier. Second of all, in terms of cost, we've been criticized that this, it costs too much to, to, uh, to develop and deploy NGI. Look, the combined NGI and GMD funding will account for one half of 1% of the DOD budget from FY21 to 26. One half of 1% to, to protect the United States against North Korea. That's not a, a large sum in my view. Third, NGI is very much consistent with President Biden's national security strategy and with his objective of, of, uh, of uh, revitalizing a lot, uh, you know, their, our, our alliances. So um, an important element of renewing our alliances is convincing allies that the U.S. is prepared to run risks on their behalf, right? So strengthening U.S. homeland defenses provides that confidence by reducing our own vulnerability to North Korean reprisals. The bottom line here is, is why would our allies expect us to come to their defense if we are not first willing to provide for our own defense? If we don't defend against North Korea, our allies will lose confidence in our security guarantees. The other objection that we get is the Russians and Chinese complain about, about the expansion of our homeland missile defense systems, and they say this will upset strategic stability. Well, this belies the fact that Russia and China are both developing uh, their own missile defense capabilities. Russia, for example, today deploys more ground-based interceptors than the United States does. They have 68 nuclear-tipped interceptors. We have 44. So, and we can talk some more about uh, these Russian complaints. But now let's talk about the SM-3 missile, which is actually related to homeland missile defense. Up until now, the SM-3 missile has always been considered a regional missile defense system. This is a, a, a standard missile that's deployed on, on Egypt ships. We also have a site in Romania, and we'll have a site in Poland as well to address the, uh, the regional threats to Europe. But we asked ourselves in, in, the, in, the, in the missile defense review, what if, what if is there some way we can, we, can, we, can, we can use this regional missile to also defend against very simple North Korean ICBM threats to the US homeland? And so we wrote in our missile defense review that we're gonna explore this. And apparently Congress uh, was thinking along the same lines because their FY18 NDAA asked DOD to conduct a test of the SM-3 missile against a simple ICBM test. 
Well, that test took place in November and it was a success. So while we welcome the success, there were many in the arms control community, in the new group community that decried that test as a potential um, uh, uh, destabilizing factor in the relationship between the US and Russia. And, and we'll talk some more about that. But, but let's be clear about this. The SM-3 2A is a small missile compared to the GBI. It doesn't have the same kind of uh, defensive footprint as a GBI would have. Uh, the ship has to be at the right place at the right time off the shore of the United States in order to provide that, that kind of protection. It, 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 it cannot protect against a, a complex Russian or Chinese ballistic missile armed with penetration aids and decoys. Again, it's meant as a capability that we could utilize in an emergency or during a crisis to supplement our ground-based interceptors, right? You take the first shot with the GBI, and if you miss, you take the second shot with the, uh, with the SM-32A. Uh, I don't see how this could potentially upset strategic stability. Even President Putin himself has said that uh, they're reaching the end of, um, uh, by this year, 90% of their strategic forces will be totally modernized and, quote, capable of confidently overcoming existing and even projected missile defense systems. So again, this notion that, that, that deploying the SM-32A to protect against North Korea is going to upset strategic stability with Russia, I think the Russians are using this for political purposes, and we can talk some more about that. Finally, on the missile defense side of the ledger, you've seen, I think, uh, already pundits uh, in the think tank community saying that we need to uh, offer concessions to the Russians on missile defense. We need to agree to limit our missile defense capabilities, particularly our homeland missile defense capabilities, in order to bring Russia back to the arms control negotiating table. There's a sense here that arms control and missile defense are not compatible. You can't have one and, and the other. And I think that's, that's just certainly not the case. History shows that that's not the case. So for instance, you recall uh, Reagan's strategic defense initiative, 1983. Uh, this was, uh, um, um, uh, for those of you who, who don't remember, this was an expansive missile defense concept that included, uh, you know, space-based capabilities, ground-based, sea-based, basically trying to make ballistic missiles, nuclear missiles, impotent and obsolete. Despite the fact that uh, the Russians knew that we were pursuing robust missile defenses, they agreed to the 1987 INF Treaty. They agreed to the 1991 START Treaty, which took our forces down from 12,000 to 6,000. We pulled out of the ABM Treaty in 2002. Did the, you know, everybody, all, all the, the critics of missile defense and the, and the anti-nuclear crowd said, my God, this is going to start a major new arms race. That wasn't the case. We ended up with the Moscow Treaty under the Bush administration, which took us from 6,000 limited under, under uh, START to uh, 1,700. Then we had the New Star Treaty under Obama, which took us down to 1,550. And now we've had the extension of the New Star Treaty. Look, if the Russians were really concerned about US missile defenses, they would never have agreed to those arms control treaties. So we, we can explore this a little bit more, but my, my suggestion to the Biden administration as they, as they, as they evaluate uh, missile defense in an arms control context is don't offer any concessions to the Russians. You wanna to talk to the Russians about this? We know the Russians want to talk to us about it. We, we spoke to them uh, uh, during the, uh, the Trump uh, round of discussions with, with Russia. Talk to them. Let's, let's uh, explain to them what our program is. Uh, maybe uh, put in some transparency, some confidence building measures to explain to them that, that these capabilities in no way, uh, shape or manner, um, uh, uh, obviate their, uh, uh, their, their nuclear retaliatory capabilities. Uh, and, and let's see where those negotiations take us. I think the Russians, if they're interested in nuclear reductions, they will do so regardless of U.S. missile defense programs. So, Peter, I'll stop there and look forward to questions. Thank you very much, Rob. We apparently have lost our friend John Harvey, who hopefully will come back. Oh, there he is. John, thank you for coming back. Um, here are the questions I have. First one is for John. Uh, I'm going to combine two. What are the factors that you think were critical in the consensus between 2010 and 2021 that enabled us to pursue nuclear modernization? And what is the relationship between that and the commonalities in the four nuclear posture reviews that have now since the Clinton administration? 
two-parter. Okay, thanks, Peter. Um, uh, great remarks, Rob. Um, the uh, we have to recall where we were in 2010. I mean, the the sort of Cold War ended in the late 80s, and for almost two decades, uh, we were in a divisive contentious debate about what the post-Cold War role of nuclear weapons were. And as a result of that debate, nothing got done. Uh, budgets were in free fall. Uh, there was some recovery uh, as, as a result of uh, uh, some of the Clinton uh, NPR with regard to DOE. But it was, a, it, was a, it was a sad situation. We couldn't get agreement on anything. You guys remember the reliable replacement warhead. You remember the modern pit facility. You remember nuclear weapons advanced concepts program, blah, blah, blah. None of that got support from Congress. They're all reasonable, solid programs. So we had to do something. And this is why Ellen started the Bipartisan Commission. And that commission had Mort Halpern on it and Johnny Foster. And believe it or not, with that crowd the le on the left and on the right, uh, Bill Perry and Jim Schlesinger got consensus, and Obama drew on this to try to put to craft a, a, a consensus on, on, on the entire package of our nuclear security. And so what happened is that uh, uh, there was a, there was, you know, Obama wanted uh, modernization and arms control. Uh, Senate Republicans wanted modernization and not so much arms control, so he cut a deal between um, as you said, uh, Senator Kyle and uh, Jim Miller and, uh, and Barack Obama to fund modernization and indeed have some of DOD's money go to DOD to help uh, bolster their program uh, in return for basically Senator Kyle saying, I'm not going to, uh, uh, I may not vote for start, New START, but I'm not going to tell other people not to vote and, and, and New START passed. So that basically, that deal that got cut was critical for modernization. And Mr. Obama went forward with it. And the other thing, he had Secretary Clinton and Secretary Gates telling him, if you don't modernize, you're not going to get anywhere on arms control with the Russians. Because why, sh why, should, they, why should they deal with us? And we were, our, our, nuclear posture, our nuclear forces were in such a way we had delayed modernization so long that we were running the risk of, of systems falling off the cliff of performance unless we replace them. And that's what we did. We set up a modernization program to replace every element of the triad and Obama got support for it. And uh, God bless him, uh, the Trump team uh, continued that effort and, uh, and ensured that uh, so far we've had maybe five, six, seven years of good, strong, stable funding for modernization. And that's how it came about. To me, the four really important longstanding elements of US policy uh, that are connected to our modernization program are basically um, triad. Uh, the fact that we, that our deterrence is based not on simply having nuclear weapons, uh, but on having the ability to hold at risk assets most valued by an adversary. So it's not simply having these things out there and they deter by existing. They deter by being able to achieve specific political and military objectives with regard to um, uh, uh, adversary interests. The third thing is uh, we have spent a lot of money over time, even in the post-Cold War period, to assure survivable second strike. And that is keeping submarines at sea all the time uh, to ensure that we are never um, uh, vulnerable to a surprise attack. And the fourth thing that I think has been essential uh, in both in modernization programs and in our longstanding policies, hedging, which is we can't predict the future. Our forces and our capabilities and our infrastructure has to be able to adapt our force so that it can respond and maintain robust deterrence into the future, and that's called hedging, and that's a uh, that's a critical piece of our nuclear posture. Peter, can, can I just try go ahead, that? Rob? I, I have a couple of questions for you, Rob, but go ahead and comment on what John had to say. No, but in this point, I agree with John, but I would also add that 
that the, the geopolitical context, I think, plays a role in, in building the, in the consensus. So when Obama came into office, you remember uh, there was this notion of a reset with Russia. Uh, Bush tried the same thing as well. And so it was in this context in the Prague speech that we uh, that that the administration had hoped that we could reduce the role of nuclear weapons and maybe even reduce the numbers uh, of nuclear weapons. Uh, but that didn't work out. Right. So uh, the Russians invade uh, Crimea. Uh, in fact, I remember the speech that Rose Gottmiller gave four years to the date uh, when Obama offered his Prague speech, a similar speech in Prague, where she talked about uh, other other nations not following our lead. In fact, uh, you know, clutching nuclear weapons even more closely. And she's referring not only to, to Russia, but to China, North Korea and other countries. It, it's in this geopolitical context that I think the consensus is 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 strengthened, right? Because despite the fact that that Obama made an attempt to do all these things to reduce the role of nuclear weapons and and and, and change the way the world thought about nuclear weapons, we were rebuffed. And I think people understand that we're in a new context. Look, look at the Biden, number one uh, 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 enemy, not enemy, but the number one challenge for the Department of Defense is China, right? And we see what China is doing in, in the way of nuclear modernization as well as Russia. So it, it, within this geopolitical context, I think it helps uh, reinforce that consensus for nuclear modernization. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Let me follow it up with a couple of questions I had. I wanna put them together. Can you give us a little bit more and what are the critical milestones for the next generation interceptor, but also how that connects to the SM3 and with respect primarily to what we're going to see out in the field, what are the strategic implications of, of doing that for our defense as well as that of our allies? Right. Um, thanks, Peter. Well, the, the first the first big milestone, of course, was uh, putting the NGI on contract, and uh, uh, the Department of Defense did so. Uh, they have uh, uh, they have a, a contract now that includes two uh, two industry uh, teams uh, to take this through the uh, um, I believe it's the preliminary design review or maybe even the uh, the complete design review. But at some point, they're going to make a decision to, to down select between these two teams and choose one team to actually go forward with building a system that we hope would be uh, 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 fielded starting in 2028. OK, so that's so your next big milestone is going to be the down select, which I assume will occur in, in probably uh, uh, two to three years. If uh, you want to reduce the risk of the program, you could actually continue to maintain those two industry teams until the first flight test. Each one would, would essentially have an opportunity to, to, to fly its, uh, its, its model. So that's, um, uh, that, that's the first milestone. The second is, uh, of course, what happens in the, uh, in the missile defense review? Are they going to maintain the uh, uh, NGI or not? Since they went forward with the contract, I would assume they're going to maintain NGI. But the question is, will, will they go forward with the additional 20 interceptors or will they use the NGI uh, to backfill the, uh, the existing 44? We have to wait and see what, what that's all about. But of course, we don't need to make that decision this year or even next year. Uh, we don't have to make that decision until, um, until we, we down select between the, uh, the two contractors. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Rob. Um, I have a question for each of you and they're related to have to do with what I call synergy. I'd like John Harvey to address the issue of, is there synergy between nuclear modernization and arms control in that one can complement the other and that's the way it ought to be done? Or, and Rob, I would like you to look at how does the synergy between discussions with Russia on arms control and missile defense play? And you've raised that, you've talked about that issue. Don't make concessions to Russia, but if you're sitting down with the Russian and you said, okay, let's come down to brass tanks. What really is the impact of, let's say a hundred interceptors on a Russian strategic deterrent? My view is, as you know, it would stabilize things. It stops the limited use of nuclear weapons. It doesn't undermine the overall ret assured retaliatory capability. And that goes to what I want John Harvey to, to raise is, we've sometimes looked at arms control and modernization as two different decisions going in different directions. So John, why don't you start off in how you see that synergy and how you think the Biden administration may look at that. And then Rob, you can look at the 
implications of our missile defenses in terms of ongoing discussions with uh, Russia. But I guess also China would be included in that as well. Go ahead, John. Uh, I just, I, I think in the, the arms control and our modernization program and our force posture and our you know, arsenal and non they are all inextric inextricably linked. Uh, look at, look at, just, just look at the debate that we had with the uh, Senate Republicans in the uh, 2010, 2013 timeframe uh, where we cut the deal for a new start and modernization. And uh, Mr. Obama wanted both of those things. Uh, uh, he saw some of the trends, I think, as well, uh, that Rob spoke to in terms of geopolitics. But I mean, they are inextricably linked. Uh, it, uh, they, helped, they helped to make the left comfortable. Armed, a solid arms control program effort helps to make the left comfortable with modernization. And, uh, and you get the votes in Congress uh, that we've been receiving over the past five or six years uh, on, the, on, the, on the modernization program. And my one concern about the Trump team is they tended to not emphasize the arms control piece of this, of our posture. Uh, and uh, without it, we have a much more difficult time achieving what is absolutely essential for our posture, which is to replace the aging system that if we don't replace them, they're gonna fall off the cliff of performance sooner than we anticipate perhaps. Yeah, I, I, I agree with John, but let, let's all uh, be careful because you don't want arms control for the sake of arms control, right? You've got to figure out what the next round of negotiations is about. And so there are some pundits out there who suggest that let's go for the low hanging fruit. We know how to do strategic arms control. So let's go from 1,550 warheads under New START to let's say 1,000 strategic warheads, ignoring entirely the non-strategic nuclear weapons that are not covered under the new start, right? So we've, we've said in the, in, in the Trump administration that the Russians probably have up to 2,000 of these tactical nuclear weapons, right? These shorter range nuclear weapons, which are not included in start. So to have a, a, an arms control treaty that would uh, lower strategic forces and not address the non-strategic would be a, a non-starter. And, and I think I think that I think the Biden folks understand that, and even even the Russians uh, I think understand that it's probably time now to uh, to try to put limits on all of the nuclear weapons, not just the uh, not just the strategic systems. So, hey, uh, oh, Rob, did you have more? Well, I was going to going to comment on your missile defense question and negotiation. Okay, I apologize. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. so it, it's you know there's no way we're going to have arms control discussions or even strategic stability discussions with the Russians without talking about missile defense. That's that you know that's a non-starter. The Russians want to talk about it, but talking about it and doing something about it are two different things, right? We we spoke about it even even uh, during the, uh, the the lead up to the New Star Treaty, and there we ended up with some language in the preamble that there's a relationship between offense and defense. But at the end of the day, the Russians know, as you point out, Peter, that even if we were to add another 100 ground-based interceptors, we would not impact their strategic deterrent. Remember, Peter, that the original ABM treaty allowed 200 ground-based interceptors, right? We have 44. The, the Russians will know when we're building up our capabilities. And uh, at that point, then they'll raise some concerns. But at, at this stage in the, in the game, I, I think we can talk to them and we can figure out ways of, of, uh, of assuaging their concerns, which are mostly political at this point. Uh, my next question is for my friend, uh, John Harvey. Uh, our colleague from the British Embassy, uh, Ms. Bland, has said, what is your view of where the Biden administration may go on the declaratory policy of not just no first use, but sole use? And her question was, uh, how can we persuade the administration not to go there? Because that is really a, a critical issue for our uh, allies uh, within, particularly within NATO, but also in the Western Pacific. Well, I think first of all, one of the things that the Biden team will need to do absolutely essentially is to engage out. If it, if it is seeking to adjust declaratory policy, uh, in, in, in whether it's sole purpose, whether it's no first use, and they're related but not identical, uh, or any or some other idea is to engage allies and to uh, not let them necessarily dictate what we do, but at least to hear what they say about it 
and to get their views on what they would find as plausible or uh, acceptable and what they would prefer not to have. And so we should do that. And so, so far to date, allies have tended to uh, dissuade uh, administra previous administrations from no first use uh, because uh, they see it uh, as a, as a, uh, a, uh, a mechanism uh, whether whether it's accurate or not as a mechanism for uh, a, a, a detaching the United States from their security. Uh, and uh, so I, I, I think I think there are members of the Biden team who see this, who see the issues and who see that, that we have some risks with no first use uh, policy and there are no real clear benefits for doing it. I mean, there are really no clear benefits other than it makes you feel good to do it. Um, and so I, I think uh, I think the allies should weigh in. They should not wait for the US to ask questions about it, but tell the US how they feel about it. Uh, and, uh, and we'll see what happens. Um, but I fully expect that the Biden team will take a hard look at no first use uh, or, or some variation of it that uh, tends to uh, mitigate some of the risks. Thank you, John. I want to go to Rob Sufer now. Rob, you commented about an article that uh, Frank Miller and I wrote about uh, the view of counterforce or going after the other guy's weapons in part is an attempt to stop a conflict from escalating out of control. And you mentioned uh, that. Would you address particularly General Hyten's comment about the Putin doctrine, what he called escalate to win? Uh, Brad Roberts has talked about it in terms of uh, theories of victory of red and blue. And he's done an extraordinary number of workshops on that. And that is the issue of if nuclear weapons are used at all, there are some people who say they never can be controlled and therefore any use is total use, as opposed to we need to have a doctrine that says, God forbid any one of these are be used, but we want to stop them from being used beyond a certain level. As I know that's somewhat in the weeds, but it is key to our deterrent policy. And I wondered if you could address that. Thanks, uh, Peter. That, that was actually a very good article. And th this is one of the, the seven misperceptions that, that the, the critics have about our nuclear policy. That is that the United States believes in, in fighting a nuclear war, right? And so they, they criticize the 76-2, uh, the which is the low-yield SLBM warhead and the nuclear slickum as being a warfighting capability as opposed to a deterrence capability. You know, you say this is in the weeds, but this really goes to the basis of the difference in views between those who, who uh, tend to support uh, a robust strategic deterrence and those who, uh, who, who are more in the arms control or the anti-nuclear crowd, right? It's, it's how you think deterrence works. If you believe that deterrence is easy and you just have, all you need is a few nuclear weapons, right? And, and, and as, soon as, as soon as you cross the nuclear threshold, uh, this escalates willy-nilly into, into nuclear arm again, then, that's, that's one point of view, and, and you think that you don't need war fighting capabilities. On the other end, if you think deterrence is difficult to maintain, right, because it depends on the scenario, the situation, the adversary, the fact that you're extending deterrence to allies that you have to, you know, if, if, if deterrence is more complicated, then you have a different view about what kinds of weapons, what kind of strategies needed. So what you're pointing out there gets at the heart. Those people who claim that we have a war fighting or a limited war doctrine, they are the, the easy deterrence uh, of the easy deterrence ill. And just a few nuclear weapons is all you need, right? But at the end of the day, what we are, what we are saying and, and what, what administrations have said going back six or seven decades is that for a deterrent threat to be credible, the adversary has to understand that we're willing to use it, right? And so a, a massive response to a limited Russian conventional attack or, or, or nuclear attack is just not credible. Because if we were to attack their cities, they would attack our cities. So we have chosen uh, to, 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 to provide the president with a range of limited graduated response options, right? With the hope of, of uh, uh, first of all, demonstrating resolve, 
to tell the Russians have used nuclear weapons in a limited way. We use them back and we say, hey, we, we are in this. You, you've miscalculated badly by going to nuclear in the hopes of getting us to back down. But we've also exhibited some restraint, right? We've said, look, you've got a lot more to lose if you continue up the escalation ladder, all right? And the hope is that they will, they will, they will recognize this restraint, recognize the fact that they have miscalculated and everybody will come to their senses and you will no longer have escalation. But having said, saying that that's our strategy and whether that's actually gonna happen during a war, nobody knows for sure. And this is the point about whether or not war, nuclear war can be kept limited or not. We just don't know. But I would argue that it's, it's, it's not strategic and it's immoral to plan as if it's gonna escalate uncontrollably. We've always planned um, uh, with the hope that there is some way to limit this. But the mere fact, Peter, and this is important, the mere fact that it could escalate uncontrollably, that actually provides the turn effect, right? So the adversary now has to worry that if he were to use nuclear weapons, we would respond even in a limited way, it could escalate uncontrollably. Right, so that enhances deterrence, and and that's that that's why when 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 the when the critics of, of nuclear weapons say that this weapon is a war fighting weapon, you have a war fighting strategy, they misunderstand the nature of deterrence. The threat has to be credible in order for the adversary to be deterred. We do not have a nuclear war fighting strategy. We do not have a war uh, a nuclear war winning strategy. We do not have a a nuclear primacy strategy. Right. All we want to do is convince the Russians that they cannot get away with using nuclear weapons in any shape or manner. Thanks. It's, it's interesting. Admiral Haney spoke uh, years ago. He was our head of our strategic command and he had a chart with what he called off ramps. Anywhere during a conflict or crisis, you want to give your other guy, the enemy, the adversary, a way to stop. Right. And he said that has to do that is part of your capabilities there to. The next question, I'd like John Harvey and, and Rob, both of you to answer, and it's connected. I want to combine two questions with China. What are the prospects and how would you get China to the table to talk about arms limits? But more importantly, what do you both think about the 145 silos that China is constructing that could contain every one of them, the DF-41, which is a 10 warhead missile? Uh, John, I'll start with you on that. I don't have a clue. I mean, the issue of not, is not just getting China to the table. I mean, that's hard enough. The issue is having a productive nuclear dialogue. Uh, and I don't have a clue on how to achieve that. Uh, and that's the challenge, I think, that the Biden team has to be thinking about as it tries to engage China. So far, even track two, uh, as my friend Brad Roberts tells me, has not been extraordinarily productive. Um, Look, let's not let's not get too bent out of shape about the 145 silos. I mean, I mean, China has always had, a, you know, uh, uh, a few uh, somewhere in the range of several tens of ICBMs uh, that could reach the United States, uh, and some of them with MIRV capability, which uh, which multiply the uh, threat. Um, the uh, to tell you the truth. Uh, if you look at it from a perspective of damage limitation uh, in a potential conflict, I'd much rather have those things be in silos than mobile because I can find them easier. Um, now that's a, a, a I mean, the, the United States has to have an option to be able to hold Chinese nuclear forces at risk uh, under certain circumstances. Uh, and uh, as you, as you, as several of you have mentioned, their mobile systems are quite a challenge in being able to, to assess. Uh, I, I, I think we should wait and see what's going to happen. I don't think we should panic. Uh, I think that as we move forward uh, in thinking about arms control with, uh, with both China and Russia, as if China makes a decision that it wants to become a uh, on the par with Russia and the United States with regard to nuclear weapons, that will affect our posture and our force size. Uh, and we just have to uh, uh, adjust to it. Ideally, uh, China has been happy with a relatively small, what I would call minimum deterrent. Uh, 
and uh, we, 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 it, it's still too soon to see whether they're going to do this sprint to parity or not. So let's let's be patient. So, so Peter, we tried for six months at the end of the Trump administration to get the uh, the, the, the Chinese to, to the negotiating table. And uh, our, our basic approach was to, to, uh, to convince the Russians and our allies to convince the Chinese to come to the table, right? And, and the basic argument was, look, up, up until now, we've sized our nuclear forces, our nuclear requirements uh, against Russia, with China as a lesser included case. As they start to build up their capabilities, it's going to impact uh, our force requirements, which may lead us to increase our forces, which would then lead Russia to increase its forces. And now you end up with, with an arms race, right? So that's the basic argument. Help us convince the Chinese that it's in their interest to come to the table and talk about this to avoid an arms race. This approach failed miserably. The Russians were not willing to talk to the Chinese on our behalf whatsoever. So I agree with, with John. They're going to have a tough time talking with the Chinese. But, uh, but I think uh, baby steps, you know, don't talk about arms control, talk about strategic stability. And there must, there must be a way to, to, to get them to the table. Um, what was the, the other the issue? issue? Was, uh, the issue was the construction of the silos. Oh, the silos, right. Okay, so again, this gets back to our previous discussion, Peter. If, if you believe that deterrence is easy, if you're a minimum deterrence kind of person, you're not bothered by uh, Chinese force expansion because as long as we have survivable sea-based forces, you know we can we can get a certain number of warheads against a certain number of Chinese cities. And for for this way of thinking, you're fine. And so don't worry about it. No need to panic, right? But on the other hand, if you think that that uh, deterrence is a little more complicated than that, now you now you're starting to think, well, I've got a certain number of uh, 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 targets in Russia, and now I've got an increasing number of targets in China. Do I have enough forces to cover both? Is there going to be a scenario where I have to do both? I don't know. We need to do this kind of analysis. We need to ask ourselves, um, what's our strategy now for deterring Russia against using nuclear weapons? And we just spoke about that, right? This, this idea of, of demonstrating limited uh, use as resolve, some restraint, right? Do we, do we do that against Russia? And then do we do that against China? Does that work? Is that enough? Or do we need to have a, a different way of thinking about it? Let me give you another wonderful example. You know, during, during, the, uh, during the Cold War, people used to describe the deterrence relationship as two gunfighters, right? They both draw their guns and uh, they, they end up shooting each other. And, and why would you do that? Well, this is the two scorpions in the bottle, right? Let's say you have three gunfighters now, right? Uh, one of the gunfighters uh, if, knows that if he's not involved in the fight and the other two kill themselves, he's the last man standing, right? And so now each of the gunfighters have to think, do I really want, do I really want to have this fight against, against one, of the, one, of, one adversary and leave the other adversary standing? This is a, this is a sloppy way of saying, look, if we get into a, a conflict, a conventional conflict with China, for instance, are we willing to escalate to nuclear use? with China, when we know that Russia will be the last country standing, these three-way dynamics become really actually uh, very interesting to think about. And we need to do a little bit more about what it takes to uh, deter Russia, what it takes to deter China, and what it means if we get into a three-way conflict. Let me go to our last question. I've been getting them from the audience, but this is for John and Rob. There have been people like Mr. Waltz who have suggested the key to nuclear issues is just anybody who gets nuclear weapons, just get them, whether Korea, Japan, North Korea, Iran, and everybody will be so terrified to go to war, they'll not go to war. Uh, I'm not trying to be flip here, John, but the administration has a tough road, as previous administrations had, to deal with the issue of proliferation. And the issue there is where do you see the Biden administration going? Uh, what can Congress do to help? Uh, because it's, it's, you have very countries that lack transparency and are not in that business, whether Korea, North Korea or whether it's uh, uh, Iran and uh, you know, potentially there are others. But would you address that issue of uh, where you see the pressures for both countries adopting going nuclear and then not going nuclear? I, I'm kind of a mixed view of President Kennedy said, we have a dangerous world out there. And he was predicting dozens of nuclear armed nations. I think we're at 11. And I think some people have pointed out that apart from, you know, North Korea 
has been the first one in and then Pakistan and India in the 90s. Uh, some people think we've been actually lucky and that the non-proliferation regime has not worked perfectly, but has worked well in some respects. So I'm curious what your thoughts, John, are in terms of administration uh, is going and what we can do to help. Well, the first, first question is, are European and Asian allies are sufficiently sophisticated technically that they could have nuclear weapons within a very uh, short period of time if they choose to go forward and, and if they seek to do so? That's, that's a fact. Uh, the second fact is uh, that uh, uh, the incentives to do so become stronger if there are concerns in the relationship and the security commitments of the United States that is extended to allies. And that's why it's so important to uh, have a strong extended deterrent commitment that is believable and credible uh, uh, not only for managing overall security in the Asian and European region, but basically to, to provide disincentives for states uh, to, to proliferate. And I think it is really not in the U.S. interest to have its allies proliferate. Uh, if I were at China, I would like to see a strong uh, U.S extended deterrence guarantee to the ROK in Japan, because it's certainly not in my, that is China's interest for those states to acquire nuclear weapons. So the US, so China should be looking at that as a, uh, as a benefit, as opposed to a detriment. Uh, that's how I think about it. I think, I think John is spot on. I would just add that missile, homeland missile defense is a component of that, right? So um, we need to provide uh, protection against North Korea against their uh, long range ballistic missiles, because if our allies come to the conclusion that, that again, we're not willing to, to, to build defenses or provide for our own defense against North Korea, why in the world would we provide defense for Japan on behalf of Japan and South Korea when we know we're vulnerable to retaliation? So again, missile defense, homeland missile defense against rogues is a, a central component of our of our grand strategy. Well, with that, I want to thank Dr. Harvey and I want to thank Dr. Sufer for uh, participating in this in our uh, Nuclear Deterrent and Missile Defense Forum. Uh, thank you both. And thank you, uh, everyone of uh, the nearly uh, 80 people that signed up and attended the event today. Uh, from all of us here at uh, Mitchell Institute, thank you. Have a great Aerospace Day. And would like people to know we are having an upcoming event with General Thompson from the United States Air Force, another space forum. And uh, hopefully you'll sign into that. If you need information, please send us a note about that and we'll get back to you. So John and, and Rob, thank you very much. I always appreciate your remarks and always uh, learn, some, learn from them. So again, thank you very much on behalf of the Mitchell Institute for your work in this area and for your participation. Take care. Thanks, Peter. Thank thanks, you. Rob. Thank you. Thanks, John.